I think the response that it's going to take to stop the free falling financial system is going to be something on the order of 20 trillion in new QE out of the Fed, money expansion out of the Fed, and proportionally similar out of every central bank in the world. This is Kaiser Johnson with Liberty and Finance, and these are the Miles Franklin Weekly Specials for July 15th through July 22nd, 2024, while supplies last. First, we feature backdated one ounce gold Canadian maples at the lowest price in years, at just $65 over spot. Next, we have backdated gold one tenth ounce eagles at $39 over melt per coin. We also have 2024 one ounce silver Britannia at $3.29 over spot. And finally, we're offering dealer's choice constitutional silver half dollars at $2.50 over spot. To order our specials or any of the many other options we have available, call us at 1-888-81-LIBERTY. That's 1-888-815-4237. We're available after hours and on weekends, and we look forward to speaking with you. Hey everyone, this is Elijah K. Johnson with Liberty and Finance. And back with us today is our good friend David Hunter, contrarian macro strategist with 50 years experience on Wall Street. David, thank you so much for joining us today. Yeah, hi, Elijah. Great to be on. Thank you. Well, it's great to have you today. I did want to get your take on all the markets today. Um, you have famously really been predicting this melt up that it seems like we're seeing right now, or at least the beginning of it. All markets are rising at the same time. And over the last few months, we've seen gold make all time high after all time high. The stock market uh, continuing to make all time high highs. Uh, did you want to give us a broad overview of what is happening right now? Sure. Yeah, my forecast is pretty much as it has been. I'm continuing to say we are um, in a melt up and heading for a parabolic melt up, which means it'll get steeper uh, until it actually goes almost vertical. So um, as I say, you can look at Netflix to get an idea what a parabolic looks like. You know, it just kept going uh, and, and picking up speed as it went. So um, that's kind of what I expect here in the next uh, two or three months in, in the stock market. Um, we had this uh, recent pause, you know, short term pullback. And you see a lot of people coming out of the woodwork saying the top is in, we're going down. That's healthy. That's what you want to see is people still being very skeptical of this market. At some point, probably in the next month or month and a half, you're going to see everybody on board and, and taking it to the top with, you know, talking about a much longer bull market here. It probably gets triggered by the Fed ultimately finally easing, or at least it becomes, you know, foregone conclusion. It's getting close. So I have said, I think we could see a, a rate cut in, in the July meeting, which is July 31st. Um, doesn't have to. They may continue to say we're going to wait for September, but we are seeing slowdown in the economy, no doubt about it. We are seeing uh, inflation trending back down after the first quarter, you know, uh, move where it started to turn upward again. Um, so it's kind of like, what are you waiting for? Uh, I've heard some talk about. Um, if they cut in July, it looks like they're panicking. Are you kidding me? <laughs> you know, we've been, they've been on the tight side for more than two years. So, um, you know, moving a quarter point in July is not a panic. It's not a sign of a panic in any way. It's a sign that they say we are slowing to an extent where we, we think we need to get started on the other side. Um, so whether we get it or not, I think the market's moving up, bond market is moving up, so rates are coming down, whether the Fed cuts or not. However, if the Fed does cut in July, it does, uh, I think it'll kind of see the animal spirits get going here and people jump on the, the um, jump on board on the basis that um, a, you know, a turn in Fed policy to ease and with further rate cuts to come, is a sign that you can start looking over the trough and look to the next, you know, the the rise in the cycle. We, we haven't even had a recession, so it's hard to talk about a, a next cycle, but it does at least, I think the street will, um, the narrative will be that the soft landing that the Fed was trying to engineer was successful and that now they're comfortable that they've gotten inflation down and probably very close to their target. 
and that they can start going the other way and that that's bullish for stock. So that's what I think the final few months of this run will be. As I said, investors, the narrative will be that there's a much longer run. I believe it, it ends probably this year and maybe sooner rather than later, meaning pre-election. But, you know, who knows, you know, trying to call it down to the it's a it's a 42 year secular bull market that's coming to an end. Trying to call it down to the you know to the month or even the quarter is is probably not particularly realistic. But you know, I'll give you what I think, and I think we will see that top this year. Now you say also before the election, I did want to get your perspective on that. Do you see the election really having any impact uh, on the markets financially here? Not really. I mean, you are obviously there's a lot going on um, between the assassination attempt on Trump. And then the replacement of Biden with Kamala, um, you know, it's it's a lot going on. But the market, as you're seeing, there's not a lot of volatility coming out of that. In fact, they've kind of sloughed it off. I've said all along, I, my bullishness is not really tied to the election cycle at all. Um, I think what's coming in terms of um, the end of a secular bull market and then a, a global bust um, you know, next year, recession into a global bust next year. Um, I think that happens no matter who wins the election. So I've kind of said the election is going to be a very minor player here. I think it really is all about um, the cycle and, and the Fed. And, and frankly, um, you know, unless, you know, obviously if something comes along, uh, another assassination attempt or, or uh, you know, God forbid, an assassination or or something more serious. Um, you know, you could see some volatility on the downside with that. But generally, I'm pretty comfortable that my forecast is happening no matter who wins the election. It seems like any black swan may have a momentary impact. Um, I did want to ask you, though, because I think some people have been arguing that this rally in the stock market has something to do with the anticipation of another Trump presidency. Do you think that has any you it seems seems like it doesn't really matter in your view um who becomes president with respect to the financial markets yeah not not in the not in this year i think ultimately and probably not next year ultimately i think we go from a you know this hyper bull market into a um a historic bear market next year again regardless of whether trump wins or or um harris wins but um, but longer term, obviously beyond the bust and beyond the bear market, they have very different policies. So it probably does have an impact on the shape of what follows the bust, what follows the bear market. But in the next year, no, I think basically it's, uh, you know, the, the seeds are sown, you know, what's almost baked in the cake in terms of what, you know, my scenario, what's going to happen. So, um, but that's not to say it's, you know, this election is very important in terms of the direction of this country, I think, beyond, you know, beyond this election. So um, not making light of the choices, more just a lot of what's going on is really what's already happened before in terms of policy. No, when it comes to what the Fed is going to be doing, it sounds like you really do see the possibility of a cut in July. Yeah, I do. I you know, like I said, I don't really it's not a big deal if it doesn't happen i'm just saying that i i think the other day it was a four percent probability that we'd see a cut in july and almost a hundred percent probability that we'll see a cut in september i think the odds of a cut in july are higher than that i don't know whether they're 20 or 25 percent um obviously the the fact that the fed goes into its quiet time now before meeting so it's you know you don't see people out there uh fed Fed of FOMC members out there talking. And usually Paul likes to kind of pre-warn the markets when he's going to change policy. Normally a rate cut would be kind of anticipated because he's, you know, sent signals. Normally he likes to send signals either way, hike or cut or change in policy. Um, so the fact that he's not because they're in the quiet period before the meeting um, has some people saying he wouldn't do that. He, he could still do it because I think some of his members are already on board saying we really should cut now. Now, many of them are not in that position, but could be convinced, I think. You know, we are definitely the, – the thing is, and I, I hope the Fed understands this, I think they do, the longer you wait, the more you risk that you went too far 
And if you then have to turn around and kind of catch up, that's more inflationary than doing it more gradually. So, so they really, by waiting uh, and taking chances by waiting, uh, run the risk that they, you know, because what you keep hearing is they don't want to prematurely cut and then jumpstart inflation again. Well, I think the bigger risk is that you wait too long and then you really do jumpstart inflation because you have to be more aggressive on the ease. Um, so so I, I think the argument can be made at this meeting that we will um, see, you know, see a cut. Um, but again, it's I think the market moves either way. It just would move faster, I think, if that happens. In your outlook then on inflation itself, obviously we have seen a a decrease in the rise of prices, although prices haven't fallen back as we almost never see deflation. Um, your perspective then going forward here, do we see another wave of inflation as the Fed eases or um, I know you've talked about very high inflation um, uh, in the future, your perspective on where we are right now? Yeah, I, I think inflation is probably done for this cycle. Uh, meaning we're going to trend towards two and then ultimately go below 2%. You can get a balance every any month or any couple months where, you know, numbers go the other way. But I think, uh, as I've said for quite a while, I think oil prices are heading lower. And as a result, I think gasoline prices are going to be heading lower. Uh, ultimately, I think this winter heating oil prices will be lower. So there's a lot of things that in, in one of the major inflationary indicators that would be heading south and probably, you know, again, I believe the Fed has stayed the party too long on the tight side. If that's the case, the economy is going to continue to slow and maybe accelerate to the downside here in the next six months. And if that's the case, I think prices are going to follow. So, so I don't think between now and the end of the bust, you're going to have a big inflation story. Again, you could get a, a month or two that uh, go the other way. Um, but I, I don't think easing here is number one. That's you know they're doing that in baby steps. It's quarter point, probably another quarter point in September if they do it in July, or a quarter point in September starts it, and then they do another one in in say November, uh, and maybe a third one in December. But quarter points are not you know aggressive ease, and frankly they uh, you know they've still been uh, shrinking the balance sheet so. So I, I don't see anything here that suggests that inflation is going to heat up. What could happen is if they could stop their easing, if they see the market at something close to 7,000 on the S&P and say, regardless of the economy, we think we, you know, we've kind of got the animal spirits riled up here and we've got to take some of this back. So they might actually even stop short on their easing and go the other way, which would be a big mistake. But um, uh, that's that's the only thing I see that could be a counter to, you know, beginning the easing process right into a bust. Now, when it comes to the impact on the average person going forward, because I know inflation has really hurt uh, the middle class, things becoming un- unaffordable, people getting into credit card debt. It sounds like that people are going to get a relief from, but then maybe their 401ks and their stock portfolios might uh, have a hit sometime soon, maybe even before uh, the election. So your take on how this all is going to be impacting the average person out there? Yeah, I don't I don't see any kind of big downside before the election. I just think that you could see a top and tops don't go you know, typically anyway. You don't see straight up to a top and then next week you start the bear market. Normally there's some process in there. So I think you'll stay, you know, for for a little while anyway, you know, weeks, if not a month or two, you might stay up around there. You know, you could fall off 5% or 10% and then come back, you know, half of that and before you start down. So so I don't see anything that's going to really cause any kind of a negative wealth effect uh, until the true bear market starts, which could it could get started before the end of the year. Uh, and certainly I think next year is a rough year for, for markets. So next year, for sure, I think, Consumers are going to feel it in their pocketbook um, because I think you could get, you know, thirty percent or even higher decline in home prices um, at the same time that you could get an eighty percent decline in stocks peak to trough. You know that will have a big effect on consumers along with if it's you know a, a downturn in the economy that's pretty severe. You know you could get unemployment up towards double digits. 
Um, so, you know, all that discomfort, I think, is coming next year. For this year, you know, the stock market, you know, does it top out in October, November? I don't know. Um, but uh, it doesn't leave you much room into the end of the year before, you know, bear market, uh, to have a bear market. So I think that probably says the bear market's mostly going to take place next year. Um, in terms of credit card, um, you know, delinquencies, I think that's going to continue to happen as the economy deteriorates here. Um, you know, there's a lot of signs that, yes, maybe it looks like a soft landing in GDP right now or in some of the numbers right now, but there are a lot of signs that what's right behind that is much worse, you know, that, that the consumer can stop on a dime all of a sudden or that, you know, businesses are going to start running into trouble. We obviously have a commercial real estate problem for the banks uh, as, as they have to deal with that. So there are a lot of lurking problems, but I don't think they get in the way of the melt up uh, in the next two or three months. Now, when it comes to precious metals, we've obviously seen quite a ride in the last couple months here um, with gold hitting new all-time high after new all-time high. We're seeing a bit of a pullback now in the last few days, but um, your outlook then for gold and silver as we continue to see this melt up? Yeah, I think gold and silver after a very long wait of years for, for silver, particularly gold's broken out and has, has tried to get to new highs several times in the last couple of years. But but silver's way behind its all-time highs. Um, it took a long time to get here, but I think gold and silver have begun big moves. Um, you know, I continue to say we'll see gold up at 3000 this year, and I think that's conservative. Um, I think, um, or I say pre-bust. So if the bust gets extended uh, into the first quarter, then it might, you know, it might take a little longer. But but pre-bust, I think three thousand on gold is a conservative number. Silver, I have raised my target from sixty to seventy-five, uh, and that's a long ways away. I mean, it, it, we're you know we're down around twenty-nine or thereabouts, um, thirty. Uh, so it's you know much more than double. Um, and the miners that go along with that, I think will will get, you know, all the benefits of, of big moves in the metal prices. So, so I'm very bullish, um, both of the precious metals for sure. Now, obviously 60, uh, $75 silver is very far away. You were looking for that though, by the end of the year, it could happen this year or it could spill into the first quarter. I think it's pretty much, you know, it's a pre-bust number. So it kind of, it, you know, again, you're right. It's from from here, say from 30 to 75 is is a huge move. Um, so I don't think it happens in three months. But, um, you know, if you get this thing going, silver has a history of once, once you, it becomes very clear that it's in a, a big bull move. Um, it can cover a lot of ground in a hurry. So um, uh, I would say certainly um, first quarter next year is a real possibility. It could, if, if things really get going here, it could happen before the end of the year. And, and if not all of it, certainly a lot of it, I think, does, get, does occur here in the next five months. Yeah, I mean, it just takes looking back at a chart of silver to 2011 and seeing that it was just a couple, couple months from when silver was $30 to when it almost touched 50 there so it can it can move pretty rapidly yeah and that's kind of the look i see in it again and again if you go back even more recently uh to um 2020 you know you had a move from um say april may to august that was pretty pretty fast and and steep so yeah that's that's its history and in a bull market for the metals Silver does outpace gold almost always. So, you know, on the way down, gold holds up better. Uh, silver gets hit harder. On the way up, silver has a catch up. And, and uh, you know, I don't know where the uh, silver gold, uh, gold silver um, ratio is right now. Um, you know, it was up over 90, I think. But but I, I think you could see that down to, um, you know, somewhere near 40 or 45. Uh, in this, you know, in this move. So, so silver definitely looks like it's going to outpace gold and, and gold's going to do pretty well itself. So, and your, and then uh, your outlook for the miners uh, in this melt up, obviously we've seen underperformance in the miners overall. Do you see that the miners will catch up? Definitely. I think it's been frustrating for investors, you know, because the metals 
woke up before the miners have, and then the miners look like they're starting to go, and then they you know have corrections again. Um, I think it is a frustrating trade, but I think there's a lot to be um, bullish about going forward. I think this most recent consolidation is just about done, and I think from here you see some pretty pretty fast moves. And back to the general stock market, uh, what are some of your price points you're looking for? And if uh, obviously we can't give financial advice, but I know you've said before that right now seems to be kind of a high risk uh, situation, if you can correct me if I'm wrong, but for your perspective on kind of the risk reward ratio in the stock market right now. Yeah, what I have said, it's, it's very tricky right now because you are normally, you would say, we're, if I'm right, you know, we're within a few months of a top. So, you know, you can never pinpoint a top. So if, if we're at the end of a 42-year run, then you're clearly in the risk period, in a period where it could reverse at any time, right? Um, however, given the unusual period we're in and the fact that I expect the parabolic from here into the top, you know, you've got potentially, you know, 25 to 50% type upside from here even if it does cover it in you know a few months, that sounds crazy. I know, but it's a, it's what we're seeing because you're coming to the end of a very long cycle. That you know, as I said, look at Netflix if you want to see a picture of something that this can look like. Um, so it, it makes it a kind of a, a difficult situation because normally the advice would be, you know, don't don't think you're so smart that you can call the top. So, you know, if you're within a few months of a top, maybe you want to get defensive. Uh, and, and for those that are really risk averse, maybe go, you know, get out of the market or what have you. Um, however, um, because we have potential to get returns that would normally take you three or four years to get, I mean, if, you, if you're talking about 40 or 50% returns, that's, that's three or four years worth of returns. If you get out prematurely here, uh, and that occurs, chances are you're going to get dragged back in. You're going to get pulled back in by your you know, investor psychology, by the fact that you feel you're missing something. And I can promise you at the top, you're going to have all these people who are skeptical of this market now are going to be telling you, oh, this thing has a long ways to run. There's a lot, you know, the Fed's easing now. This thing will go for 25 and 26 and 2026 and beyond. So you're going to, be caught if you're if you got out now, you're going to be caught. Let's say three months from now, saying, "Oh, I missed a lot. I better get back. I can't afford to just sit here and watch it go." So then you then you do get in at the top. So so I just caution people. Everybody has to kind of make their own decisions based on their own, uh, you know, how risk averse they are and how uh, how cute they want to play this. But it, it is a very tw- tricky equation. Because of that fact that, yes, time-wise, we're close, but distance-wise, we may still be quite a ways away from the top. And, you know, again, I'm, I'm out there with, a, you know, my targets are beyond anybody else by a long shot. So, so I'm not giving you consensus view. If you listen to most people, they'd be telling you you're pretty close to a top, if not at a top. Um, so, and I'm not saying I can't be wrong. You know, I'm one person with a view, but... Um, you know, my read of things, I'm pretty confident, pretty high convicted that um, we have, you know, my target on the S&P is 7,000. Um, and my target, I raised my target on the NASDAQ from 23 to 24,000. Uh, and that's a NASDAQ composite, not, not NDX, not NASDAQ 100. So the, the composite is, you know, 24,000, um, which is um, I don't know what the number is now, but probably, you know, over 30% away. Um, I'm at, um, on the Dow, I, my target is 55,000. And on the Russell 2000, my target is 3,300. And again, from here, that's a, a, a long distance away. You're at 2,200 or thereabouts. Um, so you've got a, a good long ways to go. That's, a, you know, 1,100 points or basically 50%. Um, and we had a correction, you know, we had a big jump in the Russell last week or 
you know, I can't remember. Yeah, it was last week, I guess, the week before. Um, and then it corrected towards the end of last week. And, and early this week, and people are going, you know, uh, it, that was an aberration. It's not going to I think we're coming out of that correction already. Um, this, you know, the Russell's been way behind the other indexes through this bull market of the last 18, 19 months, 20 months. Um, it's going to have a big catch up here, I think. And it's driven, in large part, it's driven by the fact that if the Fed becomes, you know, starts easing instead of tightening, that benefits small cap stocks, it benefits uh, financials, which are a big part of the Russell benefits, um, cyclicals, which are a part of the Russell. So, so I do think you've got um, a broadening out of the market ahead so that it will go from you know, this idea that it was only seven stocks or it was a very narrow tech-driven rally um, to one that becomes pretty broad-based with value playing, with small caps and large caps both playing, um, with tech still, tech, tech's getting, you know, got beat up recently, but I think tech will come back and make major new highs, including semiconductors. So, so it's going to be kind of um, a much healthier market where it's much broader. And that's part of why I think people will become convinced that, hey, this thing has legs, uh, even though I don't think it necessarily does. Now, I did want to ask you about the banking system um, and how this is all this is going to be impacting the banking system. Before we get to that, though, I just want to remind our viewers that uh, to go to libertyandfinance.com, uh, subscribe to our email newsletter if you want to keep up to date on all the interviews we do. And also, David, if you could share with us uh, about your newsletter and where the people can find you, and then we'll get into the banking system here. I'm on Twitter pretty much every day, uh, or X, whatever you want to call it. Um, you know, I'll reply to questions there and make comments. Um, so that's usually where you can find me if you want to see my uh, any updated views of things or how I, I see things. Um, and then I have an investment letter, uh, macro letter that I've been writing since 2020, uh, since uh, the year 2000. Um, and it is, um, you know, it gives you a, a lot on, you know, the view of the markets, the economy, et cetera. Um, I do not have a website, so it's, you know, people go, I can't find your letter. Well, it's by subscription, so you have to pay for it. Um, and if people want details on, you know, cost of letter and, um, you know, um, how, how to pay for it and, and, you know, what more about what's inside it, um, they can direct message me on Twitter. Um, so you see that little envelope at the top of your screen, that's your, you know, direct message. Uh, you just click on that and you can, you know, if you're, if you're on my, my page, you can uh, get to me and then just ask, uh, tell me you're interested in the letter and I'll send you details. Fantastic. Now onto the banking system here. I know last year the banks were having a lot of the banks and regional banks in particular were having issues because the value of their bond portfolios had gone down significantly uh, due to rising interest rates. And I know there's also been concern about commercial real estate um, and the value of commercial real estate dropping significantly as we move into this melt up um, and also interest rates falling a bit. Where do you see the banking? Where, what do you see as the status of the banking system? Yeah, first, I, I've been talking, as you know, I've been talking about a global bust um, for quite some time. <clears throat> so uh, my view has always been that, and, and I define a bust as something bigger than a recession, but not as long lasting as a depression. So it's pretty severe. It's more severe than anything we've seen in the post-World War II era. Um, you know, bigger than 2008, nine. And what that means is that there's a financial crisis that accompanies the uh, economic downturn that is very severe. I think this time around, and I've said this many times, the, the bigger problem for banking is going to be overseas. You know, the U.S. major banks um, were, you know, took it on the chin in 2008, nine. Um, and had to reduce, you know, they had become much less leveraged. So they're in better shape going into this. That doesn't mean they're out of trouble uh, when this hits uh, because of all the um, counterparty risk overseas, et cetera. You know, our, our world is pretty linked. Um, so I don't mean to say that they're out of the woods completely, but they're in much better shape than they were in 2008, nine. On the other hand, Europe, Canada, Australia, their banks are more leveraged 
than back then, I think, and and are more vulnerable. So I think the the problem at least starts overseas more likely and will kind of domino across the world uh, in terms of a banking crisis, a financial crisis. Um, and so our major banks, I don't know, we could still see one uh, get in real trouble, uh, one or two, but but the real problem over here is, as you as you mentioned, the regional banks because of their uh, their commercial um, real estate holdings, et cetera. Um, so, and, and we saw you know kind of a a precursor to that you know a year ago in March, a year and a half ago. Um, and so, I do think that that's probably if we're going to have a U.S. banking crisis, it's probably more focused in those regional banks. Um, the, uh, from the real estate standpoint, you are going to get a little bit of relief because I am pretty bullish on the bond market here in the second half of the year. I think you're going to see um, the ten-year down under three percent, maybe the two and a half percent this year, and you know, in the bust, I think it'll go much lower than that. I'm calling for a zero percent ten-year in the bust, but by then you've got you know real problems. But this year, with the economy still kind of soft landing. Um, getting the relief of, of the tenure going to two and a half gives the regional banks some breathing room. So they're going to probably actually rally pretty well in this, you know, last hurrah. Um, but then next year, because they're not out of the woods with their real estate and other problems, you know, consumer loans, et cetera. Um, I think next year they can, some of those are going to probably go under and get hit pretty hard. So, um, and and I think that's true in terms of when I say financial crisis, my in my whole thesis is, you, you know, you had a lot of leverage in the system in twenty in two thousand eight. Nothing like we have today. We have you know across the globe three hundred twenty trillion, three hundred twenty trillion in global debt. You know, we obviously know we have thirty four trillion in in U.S. Treasury debt um, here. That's you know it's ramping up by the day. Um, but 320 trillion in global debt, a lot of that's sovereign, but there's a lot of, you know, um, private debt as well. And we've got quadrillions in notional value of derivatives, and that's leverage on the markets. So we're in a cycle with leverage far beyond anything that's ever happened and ever been, far beyond where we've ever been before in the world. That, to me, leverage, I learned in business school, leverage works both ways. On the way up, it enhances returns and enhances a, a cycle. On the way down, it really decimates the cycle and decimates returns. You know, it can really hit markets very hard because, you know, you're forced, you know, forced liquidation, et cetera. So with that kind of leverage in the system is why I think we're, we're going to see an outsized um, downturn and outsized crisis financially. Um, and I think it'll be short and sharp, relatively short, meaning it could be uh, that it's contained within 2025, um, that most of it's over by the end of 25. Not that we're going to be feeling good at that point, but you could be at the point where they've shoveled so much money into the system, both here and abroad. You know, central banks will be printing money like crazy, that that could mean that 2026 is the beginning of a recovery, and then you accelerate from there. As I think I probably said on here before to you, I think the response that it's going to take to stop the free-falling financial system is going to be something on the order of $20 trillion in new QE out of the Fed or you know money expansion out of the Fed, and proportionally similar out of every central bank in the world. Um, including the People's Bank of China and you know Bank of Japan and Bank of Canada and uh, ECB, et cetera. So, um, so you're going to see all that money. Initially, it takes you know there's a lag effect um, before it can turn the economy. So when they and it's going to be it's going to take them time to figure out how much they need. You know, they'll start with you know, let's say if you're going to a 20, 20 trillion, they start with a trillion or two. Um, and then they find that doesn't do anything and they keep going. And ultimately, it'll take several months to get to the point where they can finally get traction. So, um, so if you, you know, if you look at it, it's probably 2026, even if they're printing, 
you know, middle of the year before you get any kind of sense of things have bottomed and are starting to turn up. It'll turn up pretty fast once it starts. Inflation is a longer lag. Um, maybe 18 months. So they're not going to be worrying about inflation. They're going to actually be looking at deflation, I think, um, in the bust. So they're going to, you know, their focus is going to be entirely on trying to save the system. You know, as I say, they'll be free falling, I think. Um, so th that means they can print money almost ad infinitum uh, because there's no right in front of them. There's no inflation. Now, the problem is once it does kick in, let's say 18 months later, it's going to just ramp up. And so you could go from, you know, negative inflation in 2025 to 25% inflation by the end of the decade. Um, so, or early 2030s, I mean, we're, we're heading for something bigger than the early eighties here. Uh, I'm quite certain of that. And again, a lot of it hasn't happened yet. I'm, you know, I'm drawing you a scenario, but I think that's, uh, I won't say inevitable, but uh, inevitable, but I think it's pretty close to that in terms of um, everything that's come before this, in terms of cycle to cycle, um, is is leading us to this. No, when it comes to, I guess, obviously, it's going to be a wild ride ahead, it sounds like. Uh, will you any last thoughts on how our viewers should navigate uh, this year, year and a half, when it seems like this may all play out? Yeah, the thing I say um, is basically, um, you know, two things. One, take advantage if you can, you know, but don't don't get yourself overextended. Don't take risks that you're not comfortable with um, because you if you're wrong, you can pay a big price. So I just tell people you can hear, you know, you can hear the volatility in my scenario. Um, and some people hear that and jump in options and then the options expire and, you know, they're, they made a mistake. So, you know, I kind of lay out a, a, um, a scenario and people just have to work within their own capabilities, their own risk tolerance, their own, um, don't get out over your skis because, you know, it's going to be punishing after this. And, um, you know, the, some people feel comfortable shorting. There'll be opportunities, obviously, to do that. Some people don't. Um, some some people are good at options trading. Most people are not. Um, so, um, you know, I think people have to kind of, and, and, you know, if you're not comfortable, you know, keep the scenario I lay out, the forecast I lay out, is really to give you a, a basis to work off of. Um, and again, I, you know, I'm one person, I can be wrong, but my track record's pretty good. Um, it, it's at least food for thought for people to kind of factor into everything else they're doing. Um, but the biggest thing, I can't give advice. So the biggest thing I say is, in the end, just um, stay within your own capabilities um, and understand that, it's not going to happen precisely the way I lay it out. Um, you know, it, it can get extended. It can happen sooner or later. Um, but it just gives you kind of a basis so that when it happens, you're not surprised and shocked and, and kind of frozen. Uh, and then on the other side of the bust, um, there'll be opportunities. You know, if you, if you don't lose your shirt in the bust, there'll be opportunities on the other side, uh, you know, we're coming up to a point where capital preservation will take precedence. As I just explained earlier in the interview, I'm not sure this is the point where you say that everybody has to make that decision themselves. There are returns, I think, still left in this market that are pretty sizable. But once we get to that point where it rolls over, capital preservation is, is um, first and foremost, because you want to preserve your wealth so that you have the ability to take advantage of the opportunity opportunities that will follow after the bust and after the bear market. And I will say the cycle that follows the bust is going to be very big for commodities and industrials, but particularly commodities. If, if inflation does what I think it's going to do, a lot of that's going to be driven by, you know, commodity prices going through the roof. And I, I won't lay out the reasons here other than the fact that when you print that much money, you create demand, and it's going to outstrip the supply of most commodities by the time we get to the late, late this decade. So oil can go from 
30 year, I'm, I'm predicting $30 in the bust um, next year, bottom of the bust. Um, it can go from there to $500 by, you know, late this decade, early next. Uh, that's a huge run. That's just one commodity to give you some sense. Um, you know, gold, I am predicting $20,000 by late this decade, early next. Silver could be $500. So, so there's, but on the other hand, in the bust, you know, if, if gold goes to 3000 or higher, it could come back to, say, 2000 or 2100 or 2,200, somewhere in there, before it takes off after the bus. If silver goes to 75, you know, it, it could give back 50% or more of it um, in the bus. So, so it's not a straight line, but there are some big opportunities following the bus. All right, David. Well, it sounds like a very interesting time ahead. We really appreciate you coming on uh, again this quarter. Um, and if our viewers uh, are interested in learning more, obviously they can find the links in the description of this video. But once again, just thank you so much for your time and God bless. Okay, thanks, Elijah. Good to see you. This is Kaiser Johnson with Liberty and Finance, and these are the Miles Franklin Weekly Specials for July 15th through July 22nd, 2024, while supplies last. First, we feature backdated one ounce gold Canadian maples at the lowest price in years, at just $65 over spot. Next, we have backdated gold one tenth ounce eagles at $39 over melt per coin. We also have 2024 one ounce silver Britannia at $3.29 over spot. And finally, we're offering dealer's choice constitutional silver half dollars at $2.50 over spot. To order our specials or any of the many other options we have available, call us at 1-888-81-LIBERTY. That's 1-888-815-4237. We're available after hours and on weekends, and we look forward to speaking with you.